Well, good morning and Shabbat Shalom and Hag Sameach. This morning is Shabbos, it is Pesach, it is the day between the two seders, and we are delighted to welcome you to Torah study for a Shabbos morning. I'm Rabbi Ed Feinstein. This is my dear friend and teacher, Rabbi Mark Gelman. Mark, uh, good morning, Hag Sameach. Hag Sameach, my dear friend. How's your seder? Nice? Terrific, terrific. Wonderful. So we, we sit at a seder, we gather our families, we tell the story of the Pesach, we sing all the songs. Mark, when you go through the Seder, what's your favorite Seder song, Seder prayer? Unquestionably, absolutely, positively, Dayenu. Dayenu. What do you mean? What is Dayenu? Well, Dayenu is, you know, if God had just given us the Sabbath or the Torah or this or that, it would be, it would have been enough for us. Okay. So the deep dive into Dayenu is, first of all, if you know Jews, it wouldn't have been enough for us because nothing was ever enough for us. We went through the freaking Red Sea. The Pharaoh got drowned in the Red Sea. We're free out of Egypt. Slavery is over. And what's our first response? Moish, Moish, we don't have any garlic. We don't have any chicken. We, we don't have any food. What's going on? We want to go back to Egypt. So aside from the, gen and this isn't Jewish, this is the general human reaction that nothing is enough. So Dayenu tells you in musical, lyrical musical form, yeah, everything is enough. Everything is enough. And this attitude of gratitude, which is the my new, mantra for the year. Added, you need an attitude of gratitude is what Dayenu is about. And it's not just that you have the Shabbat, that you have the Torah. It's being grateful for it. Like Akiba said, it's one thing, there's two brachas, there's two blessings in being, in being made B'Tselem Elohim in the image of God. The first is we're made in the image of God. And the second blessing is we know we're made in the image. So it's really two things. So the same is true with Dayenu. It's, yeah, we have the Torah, we have the Shabbos, we have all the things in the Dayenu song. But the main thing is we are grateful for them. And once you develop an attitude of gratitude, which is basically the notion that everything you have is a gift means not you, you earned it, you deserve it, it's yours by right. It's no, it's God was gracious to you and granted you through no special virtue of your own, these wondrous things. And we sitting on the pinnacle of human wealth and freedom, we, you know, are filled with all sorts of petty gripes and moans and fetches. We're about to tear our culture apart because we don't like how what who someone voted for in the last election, where our votes really <laughs> didn't matter that much. I mean, this is crazy. This is crazy. So Dayenu is like this. It's a spiritual slap in the face to say, come on. Be grateful for what you have. And that's my answer to your wonderful question. So I'll give you mine in a minute, but let's take Dayenu because I think Dayenu has another level to it. I appreciate what you've taught us. I've been thinking a lot about how the Seder came to be this year. And in my teaching this year, I've asked people to consider the first Pesach, Pesach in the year 71. Now, we, we know that the Temple of Jerusalem was destroyed by the Romans in the year 70. So I imagine what, and that was in the summer of 70. So the first Pesach after the destruction takes place in the year 71. So you consider for a moment the, the predicament of the rabbis who led the community at that point. First of all, there's a technical problem that for most of the time since the Bible, since the first Pesach in Egypt, Pesach became Korban Pesach. The heart of the holiday was a sacrifice that was offered in first in the Mishkan and then in the temple. 
and you made pilgrimage to the temple and you offered your Pesach sacrifice. And the Torah says you'll eat the sacrifice together with unleavened bread and bitter herbs, matzah and maror, Pesach, matzah, maror. Those are the three principal symbols uh, of the Seder. But now the temple gets destroyed. The simple question is, is there anything left of the holiday? I mean, the Pesach is the name of the sacrifice. Can you have a holiday Pesach without its principal sacrifice, without its principal ritual? And that's one of the problems. And the deeper problem, of course, is having witnessed this horrifying destruction, having witnessed the Romans taking down the temple and murdering the priests and destroying the city of Jerusalem, you have to have wondered what people were thinking when they got to Pesach. Where is the God who redeemed us from Egypt? If God sent plagues to destroy the evil Pharaoh, why didn't God send plagues to destroy the evil Romans? Why didn't God rescue his own house, God's own center, God's own place, dwelling place in the world? And there must have been a deep, deep sense of hopelessness, of despair, of despondency, of being disillusioned at that moment in history. And the rabbis made this incredible decision. The technical decision is we don't have Pesach anymore as a sacrifice, but you can roast the lamb and eat it at your table. And that's Dayenu, that's enough. And we don't have the Pesach, but you have Matzah and Maror, and they become co-equal symbols of the holiday. That solved the technical problem. But the spiritual problem was still present. How do you give a community hope? when they've seen the worst destruction, it's a real good post-Holocaust theology question. Where is the God of history if you've just experienced this horrendous catastrophe? And I think that what they try to say to us is that history is not over, that the processes of redemption continue. And that while we look at this catastrophe and we say, my God, God is absent from history, that's the wrong perspective. You've got to look higher and see that this is one ripple in a much larger history of our people, much larger history of humanity. And what they force us to do is to say, even though redemption hasn't complete, is not a complete process yet, even though the world is not yet redeemed, it's still an ongoing process. The bracha, after all, we say at the end of the Magid section is Goel Yisrael, a God who is redeeming us. We're not done yet. Still, we have to stop and look at the miracles we have experienced and recognize that even in the shadow of the destruction we've just just commemorated, just, just experienced, those miracles still count. Dayenu means it's not done yet, and there's a lot more to do, and there's a lot more redemption that the world desperately needs, but Dayenu, the miracles we have experienced, they're significant, they're important. And I think that your, your, your observation about gratitude is so very powerful, you know? So you can look at Israel and say, oh my God, with all the problems in the state of Israel and these last weeks, these horrific murders that have gone on, and yet to say, but we have an Israel. Dayenu, we have an Israel. Let's stop and give thanks that we have an Israel. And you look at America and say, well, all that Suris in America, and Dayenu that we have in America. And you look at, of course, Ukraine and Russia, and you say the horrors of that moment, and yet... Look at how the world has responded. To see these discrete miracles, steps in an unfinished process of redemption. That's what Dayenu is really about. It's to grasp each of the steps in the unfinished process of redemption and to still focus on them. Because that's really how we live our lives. You're never going to see the end of the process. We're all going to have to stop and see the steps in the unfinished process and rec at least see them and recognize them. Right. I, I love that. I, I love that. And in fact, that interpretation was Akiva's interpretation. And the problem with that interpretation, which is a wonderful take on it. Uh, here comes the however. I love it. And the <laughs> yeah, however, however, if, however <laughs> waiting for the redemption yeah. with such passion. Yep. Yeah can lead to identifying a false messiah as the redeemer Which and that's is, exactly what akiba did in the year 135 when the bar kokhba revolt happened and akiba 
said he was the Mashiach because he was so desperate, yeah. so desperate for any salvation. And we had that again in the uh, Shab Tzvi after the Chmelnitsky pogroms in Eastern Europe, and after 1688, and 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 the community was reaching for some kind of apocalyptic redemption. So that's the problem with that. The reason that I love Dayenu in sort of my more less activist, more passive, more introspective interpretation is, okay, we may get redeemed in the future. We hope for that. We pray for that. Maybe there'll be a Mashiach coming over the hills in Tiberius on a white donkey and we'll bring peace and in gathering and maybe that'll all happen. However, look at what we still have. The only way to basically deal with important things taken away from you, whether this is in your own life or whether it's in the history of the community. The only way I know of to cope with that is to focus on things that you still have left. Mm. And the things you still have left haven't been taken away. Why? Because they cannot be taken away. Mm. Plato's notion about a free man in chains. In chains. And this includes and has is its pinnacle, God. And it is interesting that that in the Dayenu, there isn't a reference to God. There's the Torah, right? There's the Shabbos, all of which come from God, but we still have God and we have our faith in God. Mm -hmm. And you know what I think of it? I think of what we can, I always think of this, what we can learn from other mountain climbers up the same mountain, other religions, other traditions, and how they've dealt with it. I think of gospel music in the black church, particularly in the antebellum South. I think of how did these slaves, these African-American slaves, these black slaves, how did they come up with music that was so joyous? How did they do? Because they had Dayenu in their souls. They were focused by their nature, by their ministers, by their faith. They were focused on what they still had. And what they had and what they focused on was, we're, we're going to heaven. And there's no one who can take that away from us. And, right. and we will, in heaven, we will, be, we will be free and we will be together. And, and that hope, was a redeeming hope. Now the rabbis had that hope. And the rabbis spoke about Olam Haba. And that should also have been in Dayenu, but it isn't. And I think the truth of it is that, that Dayenu reminds us of our simple blessings. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that the, the, the remarkable gift is is how the Jewish people experienced so many centuries of oppression, persecution, expulsion, exclusion, and still didn't stop celebrating Pesach. Right. And didn't give up the hope. And were able to say year after year after year, Lushana Habbabi Yerushalayim. Lushana Habbabi Yerushalayim. And here I would only disagree with you about this, not, not about the principal belief in an afterlife. That we'll discuss at a different time. We have discussed that. But here, I think it's because they saw history on a much wider scale. They saw history as an unfinished process. And they, were belie and they believed in a, in, a, in a tomorrow. They were able to believe in a tomorrow, even under the worst of circumstances. They were able to believe in a tomorrow. And that really is the substance of the second half of the Seder. That we, we often don't get to the second half of the Seder, and we finish dinner, and we... We, we, we fall asleep or we finish dinner and we, we make our way, uh, you know, uh, outside just to, to take a breath of air, take a walk. But the, it's the second half of the Seder, which is really about the exodus yet to come. It's the second half of the Seder. Where we open a door to Eliyahu. Hanukkah, yes, it is. Which is such a profound symbol, right? Elijah, right. The, the announcer, the, for, the precursor of Mashiach, you're welcoming redemption into your home. And you're singing it out into the street. I'm a believer in tomorrow. 
I have not given up on the possibilities that still inhere in this world. And then as we get to the end of the Seder, you say this last cup of wine, a, la a cup of tomorrow, and then we have all of those wonderfully silly songs at the end. All right, Adir Hu Yivna Beito Bekharov, the, the temple will be just, will be rebuilt. In my family, the most favorite song, of course, is um is Chad Gadya. Chad Gadya. Because when I was a rabbinical student, Nina and I were invited to the home of my dear professor, Professor Neil Gilman of Blessed Memory. And at Gilman's table, I'm coming to my philosophy professor's house for, for Pesach, you know, and I'm dressed in my suit and my tie and I'm sitting carefully and we get to Chad Gadya and he said to me, he says, he says, kids, in our, he has two beautiful daughters and one of them is a, they're professors now, they're wonderful people and they're themselves mothers and grandmothers. But he said, kids, we're going to make the sounds. He's like, what do you mean? Like, well, what does a goat say? Man. So we did Chad Gadya at my professor's house and all of us are goats and cats and dogs and sticks and fire and oxes but yeah, what's the sound of a stick yeah. what's the sound of a? well it's either whap or if you're really funny it's shtick you know it's like hey oh, i'm so glad good. to be here right but then the question what's the last verse of chad gadya the atta the Atta Kodesh, no, the Atta Kodesh Baruch Hu, the Shachat Yeah, yeah. The Kodesh Baruch Hu comes and God destroys death. And that's the last line of the Seder. The last line of the Seder, it's not just Olam Haba in the sense of each of us surviving death. It's one day a world in which death will not enslave us. That's the ultimate liberation. And that's the ultimate faith that's, that's tucked into the end of the Haggadah. So the fact that the Jewish people maintain hope and sing these songs of hope and, and celebrate this meal of hope and bring hope into our homes, no matter what the circumstances, to me, that's the great miracle of them. That's the great liberation of the holiday. It's the liberation from cynicism, the liberation from sadness, which I think we all are crying out for. So let me ask you the opposite question, my dear teacher. What's your, what's your least favorite part of the Haggadah? Shvoch hamatcha al hagoyim. Okay. Oh Lord, we pray that you will spill out your wrath upon the the nations, our enemies, and destroy them all. And and what's you know, the, what's the well, import of that? Well, the importance of that is not that I don't want our enemies destroyed. I do want our enemies destroyed, and the enemies of the Ukrainian people, I, I want them destroyed so that the Ukrainian people can have their freedom back. I do want that. But I don't believe that invoking God as the killer of our enemies is a noble spiritual sentiment. And I have the rabbis to back Gelman up on this. And that is, of course, the dipping of the 10 plagues, that we do it because we want to lessen our joy, symbolized by the wine, by 10 drops, symbolizing the suffering of our oppressors. So remarkable that remarkable sense, moral, moral moment. In this exactly. Story. I don't think Shvoch Hamadcha is our highest moral moment. So there is how a... How about you? There's an alternative version, you know? It was printed in the Hartman Haggadah, a different I'm unaware night. of that. You have taught yeah. me something. Tell and me. Noam Sion, who's the editor of that Haggadah, found in, an, in, a, in a manuscript, in a, in a medieval manuscript, listen carefully, it's Shvoch Ahavatcha Al Hagoyim. Really? You say to God, pour out your love on those among the nations who have come to protect the people Israel. And in the page in the Hartman Haggadah, and I stole it for the VBS Haggadah, he talks about Shifra and Pua, the two yeah. Egyptian midwives who saved Jewish children in Egypt. He talks about those during all the generations of our people, and particularly, of course, during the Shoah. Where was this from? It's in, it, you'll find it in the Hartman Haggadah. Yeah, and but where did they find it? He found it in a manuscript someplace. An, an old manuscript an or old some man, 
you know, modern. Oh, no, 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 no modern new age. I knew you were going to accuse me of that. Yeah, yeah, I am. No, I love this. This is much nicer. It was much nicer. Let's find the moral allies. Let's find the gentle among all the peoples of the world, Hasidei Umota Ulam, those who are prepared to protect the vulnerable and to care for the weak. Let's find all of those, like Shifra and Pua. Sure. And Oscar Schindler and Raoul Wallenberg and Sempo Sugihara and Jupe Westerval. Let's find all of those who risk themselves and sometimes sacrifice themselves to protect God's people in every generation and let's ally ourselves with them and that rescued that little piece of the Haggadah for me otherwise you're exactly right it's a it's a really difficult piece of the uh, uh of the seder a really that's beautiful piece. that's beautiful i don't feel i don't feel angry anymore. i've redeemed i've redeemed rabbi kelman's really? soul completely how I, very man. wonderful how how very no that's really beautiful yeah about what changes what what distressed you most? You it, asked me. Shvacha well, Matcha is certainly a, a, a terrible, distressing uh, part of the uh, part of this. And the, you know, I think the other piece. I, I will. I love what you've talked about in terms of the plagues, right? The fact that we dip out the wine, which is a silent. You don't say anything. You're you're reading the the plagues, but you're saying you know there the, there were innocents among the Egyptians as well, right? Um, the, 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 there is a midrash that comes right after that, where the rabbis want to expand the plagues. <laughs> and I, you know, one of the rabbis says it wasn't fifty; it was it wasn't ten; it was fifty because it says the hand of God. Yeah, yeah. The I finger of that. God is a plague. The hand is fifty, and there's another one that says two hundred and two fifty. I once had an Egyptian friend at the seder. Believe it or not, a friend of mine came was in from Egypt, a Christian fellow, and he was joy. He said, "Oh, come on, guys, please, enough," you know. You know, there's a know. we have a tribalism in us. Yes, there is a streak of now. There's nothing wrong with being proud of our people. There's nothing wrong with worrying about our people. There's nothing even wrong about worrying about people first. It's true. I am worried about the Ukrainians. I really am. And I, but I'm a little bit especially. I'm a little bit more worried about the Jews of Ukraine. I just a little bit more. It's my mishpacha. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing wrong. I don't think with that. I don't think so. As long as you understand that you're part of a larger world and you're responsible for that world. But when that tribalism goes crazy, when that tribalism becomes us against them and divides us from them, our people from those people, the chosen people from everybody else, when that tribalism seeps into us and makes us close our eyes to the suffering of the other, then it becomes a serious problem. So right. there's that Midrash that we all love. There's this tremendous Midrash, of course, that is, as we cross the Red Sea, the people of Israel start dancing and singing on the other side, Michamot yeah, yeah. Elim Adonai. And the Midrash is the angels in heaven begin to, to dance and sing, and God hushes them up and says, my children are drowning in the sea, you don't sing. And, and what's beautiful is that the Midrash, it's not that it condemns Israel. You know, the Israelites can celebrate. They've been slaves and they're free and their oppressors are being destroyed. You can celebrate. It's okay. But there's a higher morality, in this case, an angelic morality, a divine morality, which says, you know, you don't have to turn the other cheek to the oppressor, but you don't have to celebrate their downfall either, right? You know, I, I want the Ukrainians to be free, but I'm not celebrating how many poor Russian kids who were conscripted into the Russian army and sent across the border without proper equipment are getting are getting schmeist. And, and that kind of that kind of celebration, that kind of tribalism that we Jews sometimes inhabit is not is not attractive. No, not I agree. Well, like, can we talk about one of my favorite topics, which is food? I'd like your reaction to how the Pesach meal has survived generations of assimilation. Mm. And, and I'd like to propose to you that we can look to the Passover meal as evidence of the weakening of Jewish bonds. Now, and I bring forward as my evidence, the death of gefilte fish. There is no question, <laughs> no question at all in my mind that properly made gefilte fish is among the top five foods of the world. 
and and especially the way my my family made it my mother made it the way my bubba made it the, really where you mix the fish and the thing and you make the broth with the bones and but nobody likes gefilte fish anymore and on many menus it's either disappeared or worse the, those little things in the glass jars which are not gefilte and not fish are, are, <laughs> are, are, are offered in return so that's number one number two the death of chopped liver chopped liver was always a part of the 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 meal it was gefilte fish and chopped liver or chopped liver first and then gefilte fish and then the soup and then the brisket and the, and that's disappeared and it's okay so if you eat it it clogs up your heart and kills you okay yeah. okay that's a that's something to consider i don't i don't mourn the death of, of chopped liver because it would be the death of me if i yes ate. i know that but right. it should not disappear now and, gefilte fish i will tell you first of all there's a beautiful movie and i'm sure it's online someplace called gefilte fish and it shows three generations in a family bubba has a gahak a gahaking bowl my, yeah. my bubba had a gahak there you know and she would yeah, buy yeah. the fish and the fish would live in the bathtub until it was ready because it was mamish like alive you know and she would take the fish out and she would clean the fish and then she would gahak the fish in a wooden it, bowl in, a, in wooden. a wooden bowl then mama did it in a food processor yes. she bought the fillets ready cleaned and she made it into food processor and the daughter in this movie the daughter gets the jar and she says i put a little carrot on the top makes it nice right so and the fourth generation i'll make you i'll make you sick mark i was i was actually in, a, in an italian restaurant up the street here having a a lovely meal and the manager happens to be a Jewish fellow and we're talking about Pesach and he wants to know, you know, what do you do? And he tells me, he says, I have something for you. I'm going to bring you something. So he comes to the kitchen, comes back out and he brings me a plate and he makes, ready for this? He makes gefilte fish out of fresh Pacific salmon. It's what? gourmet gefilte fish, oh. right? With, 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 with a miso sauce, with a, a Japanese... Oh miso sauce <laughs> that's the new gener generation i think my dear friend in this case i am a conservative rabbi you are the reform rabbi but our roles have reversed because i'm going to speak for change not tradition oh my god we ate gefilte fish for a simple reason because we yeah. couldn't afford fish right all you One got was a skinny fish. pike and in order to feed a family of 10 with one, you know, nebuchadnezzar, a carp, a skinny carp, 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 carp. A carp, right. You took out this fish, you gahaked it up, you mixed it with breadcrumbs and vegetables so that it went farther. And that's, that's what gefilte, gefilte means filled up fish, right? I think it's meal. time to let go of peasant food and eat something better. No. I don't think it's no. a bad problem. No, no, no. <laughs> Oh. So at my table, we're going to have la, sashimi. La, 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 la. We're going to have sashimi instead of gefilte oh, fish. Oh, no. That is West Coast. Oh, and no. you want to know something, Mark? In 200 years, my great-great-grandchildren, Alavai, will say, oh, this is the sashimi that our ancestors oh, ate my in the God, land of Egypt. No. Let all who are hungry come and eat. Let all who need to celebrate the traditions of our ancestors come and have a bissel sashimi with a nice light. Okay. Meal. I'm only happy that in 200 years, I will have been dead for at least 10 years. So <laughs> I will not be around to see that abomination. As hey. Amos, the prophet said, Toevo, that If you want to live those 200 years, you better lay off the chopped liver. I know, oh, I know. Well, Mark, so Go oh, ahead. You no, know, and and other than that, you know, I'm I'm glad brisket has survived, but you know, the vegan satyrs, I understand that's a place for change. And but all. here's the wonderful thing. Look, look what the rabbis did. And this is what I celebrate. The rabbis faced a world of destruction where the holy place, the Beit HaMikdash, the temple was destroyed. So what did they do? They said, bring it home. Take the Seder take the Pesach, bring it home. We'll celebrate it, not in the Holy Temple of Jerusalem, 
We'll celebrate it at the family kitchen table, right? We'll do services. We do services this morning for, we'll do right after this, we'll have services for Pesach and it's nice to daven Hallel, for example, but you know, Pesach belongs at home and that's where my memories live at home. And what a brilliant revolution that was. It's perfect. It's to bring perfect. it home and set it at the table and build it around a meal and give us food as the props to tell the story. It was a brilliant move. So whether you have gefilte fish or sashimi or something vegan, I know that Rabbi Gelman will be disappointed, but I will not. I will thank you for celebrating Pesach and being free. Mark, let me wish you a happy, healthy, sweet Yontif. You too, my friend. Shabbos. Dayenu, Dayenu, Dayenu. Dayenu, Dayenu. Let's get out of Egypt safely tonight and let's find our way to freedom. Hag Sameach, Shabbat Shalom. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Quick God program bless note, you. a program note. Following this, services here at VBS in person and online. Tomorrow, services Sunday. We will have services at 9.30 in the morning, but only online. We want to let our, our friends who celebrate the Easter holiday have their holiday with their families. So we're only going to celebrate online. Don't come to the shul. Tune us in on Facebook and YouTube. We'll be davening through the service and reading Torah, making Hallel. Next week, Friday, we have service together. Shabbos, we'll have service with Yisker. Let me wish you a happy, healthy, and sweet Pesach. Hag Sameach V'Kasher.